Hi, welcome to everyone's favourite segment, Mailbag. Let's get right into it. This one comes from Oliver Yu from Estonia. Hi to all my Estonian viewers. All right, let's... We, we get a couple. We've had a couple from Estonia, have we not? Um, I believe so anyway. Oh, bloody... Uh, what are we what are we doing here? Arr, this is annoying. Giving up on the knife on this one. It's just like it's just too fine. Um <laughs> just, it's just ridiculous. Ridiculous. Ah, bloody tape. Hate tape. Alright. Here we go, there we go. There we go. We're in like Flynn. Alright, we've got the good old paper packaging. Power cord. We, we've got a plug pack. And I can't pronounce that. It's a it's a th it's a thermostat. And oh geez, we've got lots of stuff. Hang on. Oh wow. Is that an Estonian model 1980 transistor radio? Beauty. <laughs> I'm two minute tear down. Ah. Oh, Little four banger Estonian calculator, I presume. Estonian calculator. Beauty. Check it out. We've got some nice postcards. I can't uh, read a word of it, but uh, old school. Look at that. Brilliant. And this is actually a Russian calculator, the B3 14, made in 1988. Um, yeah, okay. <laughs> Fair enough. And yes, it does work. Look at that. Bobby Dazzler, square root. Ah, winner, winner, chicken dinner. These are these rare AA plus size batteries, and one of them's an Australian version. And it looks like this is some lesser model. Check it out. <laughs> Quite a few keys missing there. And uh, look, we've got ourselves our vacuum fluorescent display. Love the nipple. Always love playing with the nipple. And let's take a squeeze under there. Oh, and unfortunately, this is not going to come out without a fight. But there's our uh, high voltage driver, no doubt, for the vacuum fluorescent display. And there we go. Oh, we've got the um, staggered pin chip. Can you read that number down in there? Anyway, beauty. Look at that. I always love those, uh, <laughs> those staggered pin uh, packages. Not staggered. Yeah, staggered pin packages. I can't remember the damn name from them off the top of my head. Anyway, cool. And I'll call this the Mokba 1980 Transistor Radio. Thank you very much. Ooh. Still working. <laughs> I got something. It doesn't sound Russian to me. Made in the USSR. You don't know how lucky you are, boys. 9 volt battery snap. Very modern. Flathead screws. None of this Phillips rubbish. Oh, classic. Check it out. <laughs> We got these. Are, look at our transistor packages. They're like, they're like flying saucers. Oh, that's just beautiful. Oh, anyway, look at that. Wow. Check that out. And this one down here, of course, it's got the switch built in. No worries. And uh, some tuned slugs there. And a couple of trimmer caps and Bob's your uncle. And that's our main tuning cap, of course. And there's, I won't take it all apart, but there's going to be a band coming over here because that, that is the uh, tuning dial there. So there's going to be some, you know, band or something going over here and then driving the uh, pointer on the front. But that's just changing the value of that uh, tuner cap there. Actually, is that a date code? 79, I wonder? Hmm... There you go, identify that transistor and win a prize. Maybe. No. But can you? Hmm. Yeah, it's 79. Once again. I think it was made in 79. I don't think I even want to see inside this, but I'll take one for the team. Actually, that's not as bad as I thought, but yeah, <laughs> it's a bit how you're doing. I've got a DHL one, you know, it's commercial from the Shanghai Zhiyue. Robotics Co. Limited. Robotics. Beauty. All right, let's check it out. See what they've sent. It's directed to EEV marketing. <laughs> Go figure. Anyway. Whoa. DF Robot. 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 Give me the robot. Oh. Windows 10 computer for everything. I wanted a robot! 
Don't you hate it when you want a robot and you get a Windows 10 computer? But cool, Windows 10 single ball computer, let's check it out. I can't say I've ever heard of the Latte Panda, but there's so many of these, uh, you know, Internet of Things little single ball computers these days, which is great, choice is good. Anyway, um, what's interesting is it's a Windows 10 computer designed by Latte Panda in Shanghai, uh, LattePanda.com. There you go, assembled in China, of course. Um, yeah. Why would you have designed in China and not have it made in China? Anyway, 2 gig of RAM and 32 gig uh, solid state memory. It runs Windows 10. Let's check it out. Tell you what, that looks pretty jazzy. And look, it's all under a metal can here. And they've got that uh, laser etched on there, the Latte Panda 2 gig of RAM. And that's uh, eMMC, which is not as good as a proper solid state uh, drive. So yeah, not as fast, not as uh, high performance, but in a little form factor like this, um, they've got themselves a header and a main header here. Uh, not sure what this little header over here is doing. There's a little reset -y button or something there, but everything's under the can. We've got one USB 3 port. That's great. Uh, two regular USB ports, a regular HDMI, none of that uh, mini rubbish. Another little header here. Not sure what that's doing. And but a micro USB, probably on the go, uh, micro SD card slot, looks like we've got audio out, we've got the requisite uh, Ethernet, of course, and uh, I presume that's uh, gig Ethernet, is it? Yeah, probably. Anyway, I should look up the specs, and these look for all the world like um, PWM outputs, perhaps. And this actually comes from Emma, who uh, works for this little uh, startup, and she lives in Shanghai and's uh, been working in a small team of makers and developers, a new type of single board computer. It's called the Latte Panda. It uh, uses the Intel Cherry trial processor i don't know i don't keep up with all these names and includes a full copy of windows 10 not the uh, internet of things core thing integrated wi-fi and bluetooth when compared to a regular pc or laptop it stands up quite capably it also has an arduino uh, leonardo co-processor ah and gpio for physical computing applications cool excellent so uh, the presumably the io stuff is done on the um on the uh, Arduino uh, Leonardo Co. processor under there. Anyway, thank you very much, Emma, for sending that in. And here's all the requisite stuff. Wait, hang on. Now they're saying 4 gigs of RAM and 64 gig of onboard flash. So, yeah, I don't know. They've doubled it, have they? Uh, it says half that on the uh, laser etch package. Maybe they upgraded it. It's got an integrated Wi-Fi. Um, it did come with the cable in the box, uh, like the antenna. Uh, cable, uh, Bluetooth uh, 4, HDMI, USB 3 integration. Fantastic. Yeah, and it comes pre-installed with uh, Visual Studio, Node.js, Java, all that sort of stuff, and uh, processing as well, which is the uh, Arduino thing. Unfortunately, I did not get the 7-inch uh, um, 1024 by 600 IPS display. Oh, bummer. Anyway, um, uh, plug-and-play sensor connectors. Okay, that's what those things are, and that's the Arduino uh, pin-out up the top. It doesn't seem right is that a different one anyway i can't keep up to date with all that sort of stuff wi-fi and bluetooth 4 and okay that little header there is for the uh cpu gpio so that's for the intel uh, processor as opposed to the uh, arduino uh pinouts there so that's pretty cool and it uses and there's the uh, atom uh processor in the puppy and I do like the fact that it's powered from the micro USB there. I know some people don't like it, but I personally do. I love that everything standardized that I use is uh, micro USB. Makes it easy. You know, if you have like a DC barrel uh, jack on there, then uh, it's just, you know, you're always missing the right one or it's not the right size. And it's just a pain in the butt. So, yes, thank you very much. Needs a uh, two amp adapter, of course. And there's a little uh, patch antenna for the Wi-Fi. All right, I'm keen to try this. So let's... Uh plug the power in, we've got keyboard, mouse, and uh, let's see what we have here. Sorry, I should actually capture it, shouldn't I? But uh, let's see, I've got a 2 amp power adapter on there. Nothing's coming up at the moment. I selected the right input. HDMI. Yep. Takes time to boot. Hang on. Although there's no lights on it anymore. What's going on? Is my power adapter not good enough? My cable not good enough? I'm not sure. Hmm. I'll get back to you. 
Nope, I tried another cable and this blue LED flashes here for about five seconds and then switches off. So, um, that signifies that it's booting, but I, like, meh. And that's what it's drawing during the boot. I got desperate and used an external power supply, but it's still not working. Look, it's, it, it booted up and then it's gone down to, you know, uh, 0.3 watts, like standby or something. It just doesn't seem to boot. I don't know what's going on. Aha! Apparently there is a power button on this thing. Press and hold? Or something? Hey! Yep! We're in like Flynn! There you go! Uh, why it doesn't boot up when you, uh, like, just plug the power in? I don't know. That's a bit of a fail. Um, I don't like having to uh, press the soft power button. How does that work in an embedded application? You, do, you know, the button's hidden away, so maybe there's some way to do it. I don't know, but uh, anyway, I think we're in like Flynn. Our Latte Panda is drawing 1.27, yeah, 1.25 amps, uh, which is uh, about five, six watts, six watts or thereabouts. Anyway, it's now booting, and takes about 10, 15 seconds to boot this apparently. And we'll be supposedly in like Flynn. Hmm. Come on, you can do it. I think I should wipe the dust off my screen. What do you think? Hmm. No, it's gone back into standby mode again. What's going on? Drawing like point, um, 7, 0. 0.077 watts or something. 0. 0.77 watts. No, it said it was booted and it's gone into bloody standby mode again. Do you believe it? Wow. What's going on? And I tell you what, I don't like the fact that this power LED's on the back like this, right? And that comes on. And the power button is this second one here, which is not labelled. Like, how are you supposed to know? Uh, it, it's... Nah. Fail. I think we're in. I re-plugged in the original 2 amp plug pack with, an, with another USB cable, which I was using before. No? Okay. All of a sudden, we're in. So... Maybe there's an issue with power drop on the cable, but I've been using my, I was using the power supply before, which has not been a problem uh, in the past for stuff that's required two amps. But anyway, there you go. We're in and we've got ourselves the, yeah, the mouse works. We've got ourselves the Arduino interface. Oh, Internet Explorer, give me a break. Jeez. Anyway, we can just load up Arduino. And presumably that's going to work out of the box. Sorry, I won't have time to uh, do it in the mailbag here, but presumably, yep, we can just uh, do that. Um, yeah, I'll connect that. But presumably we can just uh, select the um, the board that we want to go to and... Uh, is there, oh, yeah, no, it said it was Arduino Leonardo or something compatible, so I don't think we'll actually find a uh, panda there. No, anyway compatible and it seems to work out a box and bingo we're in like Flynn running regular windows so that's very nice hang on the mouse is really laggy I'm not sure what's going on here not I I'm I'm moving that mouse but it's it's jerking around this thing's jerking me off not nah, now we're back so I'm not sure what happened there um, yeah a bit of a grunt issue perhaps I'll tell you what, seems to be uh, slow as a wet week. No, nah, this thing's so slow, I can't... Oh, no, there we go. Uh, it, maybe it's it's still booting, doing Windows thing. That might be a Windows issue, but anyway, yeah. Um, <laughs> we'll get there eventually. Hey, vblog.com, the place to be. Thank you very much. And we're in like Flynn, look at that. Yes, the electronics... Uh, Expo is coming up. Yes, I will be there. No, I won't have a booth this year. Um, and we're there. And we can go to the forum and everything. The forum is the place to be. Anyway, that is... Uh, I have to download a decent browser. Although Internet Explorer or Edge or whatever it's bloody well called these days. Whatever. I don't know. Anyway, um, yeah, it's not the quickest thing around, let me tell you. But it worked out of the box. Didn't have to set up the internet. Just plugged it all in. And we're in like Flynn. So you know I'm going to try and install Boink. Love a good Boink. So let's uh, go in here and uh, it should work a treat. But yeah, this is not particularly quick. But anyway, 
<laughs> it's running Windows 10. Hey, and there you go. There's the Boink uh, benchmark for those playing along at home. 968 floating point MIPS and 1823 integer MIPS uh, dry stone. Okay, it is running Boink, and I set it to uh, stop halt the CPU if it's using more than 25% of the CPU, but it's just showing suspended. I'm not doing anything else in the background at all, so yeah, I've got to actually force that on, so I'm not sure if that's normal or not, but anyway, we are running, and there is no uh, GPU in the thing, so it looks like we can't do that. And I can just keep my finger on that, so it's not quite running at 50 degrees. I've only had it on for five minutes. I haven't had it process in uh, Boink very long, but still, yeah, it's 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 tolerable. Certainly, oh, yeah, it's doing the business. I could get the thermal camera on there, but um, the problem is I'd have to oh, I'd put some black tape on there, otherwise the reflection is not going to be a uh, true indication of the temperature in there. So I'll call it quits for the Latte Panda now for the mailbag, but uh, I could do some more with it. If you've got any uh, stuff I want to, uh, if you want me to do with it, then we can do another video taking a look. The boot uh, thing could have been a pebcac on my part, it could be power issues or whatever, so don't take that as anything. But I don't like the fact that it doesn't boot up and power on. You've got to do the soft power button, maybe there's some overwrite. Uh, for that because for embedded applications you need it to just boot as soon as the power goes on none of this soft button uh, turn on rubbish but uh, yeah anyway um, Arduino functionality built in and I think it's quite reasonably priced it's uh, 79 US bucks to 139 depending on the configuration of the memory and uh, everything else but uh, yeah that's quite a reasonable price considering that Windows 10 is included with this thing a full uh, licensed copy of Windows 10 and it's got a quad core Atom uh, processor in it. It's only 500 megahertz, not the fastest thing around. It's going to be a bit sluggish, but hey, it's a full Windows 10 implementation. So beautiful. With the Arduino, if you want to do something, you know, if you want to have a, a top level processing uh, application, top level stuff happening in Windows, and then you just want to run some independent uh, Arduino stuff um, that's separate from the processor. In fact, I need to check this. I need to check it, but uh, I won't do it now. But presumably, if you power this thing up, maybe the Arduino runs and that can actually run. And then only if you turn on the Windows computer. So that might be a reason why they've got that delayed boot up. That would be my guess anyway. In that case, that could be all right. Anyway, it's interesting beast it's worth checking out a reasonable price so we're now running uh, all four cores there plus the gpu beauty hi to all my lithuanian viewers uh this one comes from jelena galova thank you very much Gal galena jelena something like that anyway um from uh villainous in lithuania so let's i can't really make out what's on here. It's got the description, but uh, yeah, I don't. Uh, I don't think we have. Sounds like there's a lot of stuff in there. Obviously, we have not got a lamp. Um, gotcha. I've got. Oh, oh! I thought it was just ah oh, wrapped in. The best stuff comes wrapped in lollies. Oh, beautiful. What a, What is that? That's interesting. Looks like a press stud thing. A creative zen who lusted after the creative zen back in the day. Um, that was before the... Uh, was it before the iPod? Or was it um, creative's answer to the iPod? I can't remember the timeline. Anyway, um, yeah. Cool. I think two minute teardown on the creative zen. So these are from Vlad in a customary packaging material to hide the distinct smell of dead electronics. Uh, creative Zen Touch 2004 and uh, this is a sleep monitoring headband produced by the now out of business Zio Inc. It was a nice product when it works, company going out of business, replacement headbands. Anyway, there you go. That's the Zio. Comes with a little stand like that and uh, yeah, we've got like a headbandy. Uh, type thing and uh, you know they're the uh, sensor contacts that go to the headband just like uh, the heart rate monitors and stuff like that and you just whack it on there and it recharges and oh yeah that's all right 
there you go that's inside the sensor board we've got our uh, little rechargeable lithium battery there and what do you know we've got a tiny gecko processor we've seen those many times on the uh, blog before perfect for uh, low power applications like this going off for some flat flex going off to the sensor pads and um there's the uh, antenna there so what is that puppy using hmm won't be bluetooth yeah, I can't really find any info on those at the uh, first suck of the sav, but they're probably, um, like, a, it's not going to be a Bluetooth thing. It's probably going to be one of the low-power transmitters, Ant, or, uh, you know, Zigbee, something like that. One of the uh, low-power jobbies. And that's most likely going to be an accelerometer, because, well, I don't know. You need to buy and figure out what you're doing when you're sleeping, when you're tossing and turning. Two-minute teardown on the Creative Zen. Is anyone still using one of these puppies? And of course, back in the old days, we had hard drives, didn't we? <laughs> and there's the uh, big lithium uh, rechargeable in there, taking up most of the space on the back. So it's a reasonable form factor. This is actually nicely modular. You take out these plastic uh, pieces on the side here, and then this whole thing just pops out. We've got a board-to-board -board interconnect going over to our uh, uh, buttons on the front. But there you go. It all comes out in one big module. That's all she wrote. Got a huge amount in there. There's a TMS. Is that a TMS320 for all you TMS fanboys? TMS320 fanboys, DSP. Yeah, they're being used for, oh, how old is the architecture now? 30 years or whatever. Still used. Fantastic. And, uh, yeah, not a huge amount more to say about it. But, you know, they could have possibly made it smaller, perhaps, but not by a huge amount because it's... You know, the battery and the hard drive is going to uh, dominate inside this thing. Uh, you know, they've used a huge header here, but uh, anyway, they've put a decent copper shield under that under that hard drive too. Look at that. Wow, they were quite serious there. But anyway, that's inside the Creative Zen. Two-minute teardown. Thank you very much, Vlad. And check it out. It still works, and there's songs on there. Beautiful. <laughs> And yeah, robust technology, purpose-designed, um, portable music players, but I I can't say I see anyone using them uh, much anymore. Everyone's got their huge, big, fablet, bloody iPhone thing strapped to their arm at the gym and stuff like that. And yeah, but uh, there's something to be said for a purpose-designed device like this. I'm not sure what the battery uh, life or anything is on this wouldn't be great with the hard drive and everything else but uh, I had one of those I think it was a creative I can't remember the model number it was a little single double A or triple A battery was it and that was a great little compact thing it was like uh, it was only a uh, barely a couple of cubic inches or something it was tiny and uh, it did the business and um, little do people know, I actually um, uh, applied for a uh, patent uh, back in the day. Yes, I did. Um, for an, well, a, um, a software that uh, generated exercise stuff for early music devices like this that let you do your workouts at the gym and had voice prompts and uh, everything else. But that was uh, before smartphones. And then, yes, yeah, smartphones came along like six months later, didn't see it coming and yeah, that just completely killed that with the app model and everything else. But there you go. Hands up if you're still using one of these things. And the interface on this, I don't mind. It's got a capacitive uh, sense here. And, you know, the menus, it works pretty well. <laughs> Pinball is it? They're, they're an Elton John fan. Now the commercial DHL one. This one comes from the office shipping and mailboxes from Ray Lacey. It doesn't say, like company name or anything so anyway go figure i do like the uh, sound of the description of the contents so does this have one of those weird ass pull thingies no Ooh, comes in its own carry case sony sony wow oh right i thought i assumed it would be new i don't think it is Ta -da. lake tahoe virginia city awesome and we have a sony fix fixus wow gps receiver interesting the ips 360 for those playing along at home wow look at that <laughs> 
old school. I mean, yeah, you can fit GPS in a square inch now, but um, wow, when does that date from? Interesting. Huh. Yeah, designed for car use. It's got the cigarette lighter adapter. <laughs> Beauty. And Dave has sent in this Sony Fixus IPS360 GPS receiver from about 1991. Wow, that's way before they turned off selective availability and made geocaching, yes, that's how it's pronounced, caching, none of this caching rubbish uh, from you Yanks. Um, uh, Sony had, uh, were in the GPS market in the early 90s. There you go. <laughs> they abandoned it before the end of the decade, before they turned off selective availability, and it became huge. It even makes no reference in the manual to selective availability. There you go. So let's check it out. Woohoo! Look at this. Ah, oh, beautiful case. And this is what you had to do back in the day. Look at this. You had to set it up, put it like that, put it flat like that, and, well, oh, hopefully, <laughs> if you're not perched on a rock somewhere, but yeah, imagine carrying that around. But hey, that was what you had to do back in the day. I mean, none of this, I uh, mean, they didn't have the surf uh, chipsets and things like that back then. So this will make an interesting two minute teardown. Let's go. And here it is. Look at the O-ring around there. This was obviously uh, designed for marine use and uh, stuff like that. It's going to be waterproof. -y. We'd find an O-ring seal in the um, base unit as well. But there's our receiver, obviously. So that, well, our front end for the antenna uh, stuff, all the uh, processing stuff would be done in the uh, unit itself. And uh, it just uses a little, um, where's that? Yeah, just a little uh, uh, header type interface cable going over sort of yeah weird little customy thing but hold on to your hat that's not all of it something look at that big shield under or is that just no i can see another board under there i think and bingo there's the rest of it there's our processing and oh look a xilog Xilog Z80 series, one of, not the original Z80, but one of the uh, later ones with a three-hole ROM. They've actually sold it, hand-soldered the ROM in there. You can still see the residue left over. Oh, wow, a couple of custom uh, ASIC. Um, uh, well, there's an RTC there, battery backup, and uh, a custom Sony part. Of course, Sony uh, rolled their own silicons lots, but oh, for all you Xilog fanboys. And sure enough, inside the back here, yep, rubber surround. Look at that beauty. And I actually like the connector uh, system. It's uh, sealed as well. Not O-ring uh, sealed, though, but it's plastic into, yeah, it's plastic into surround anyway. So they're adding, to some, adding something to the water resistance path there anyway. But anyway, let's go in. Very typical early 90s construction. Look at that. There's our Sanyo. Is that our uh, LCD driver? And uh, another Sony custom part down there and something on the other side. And we've got ourselves a Hitachi H8 there. So that's interesting that we'd have a, a H8 series in here, but in the uh, receiver, Xilinx. Go figure. Anyway, um, yeah, completely what you'd expect in there. Little super cap there for battery backup, but uh, yeah, that's about all she wrote. So thank you very much, Dave, for sending that in. That's an interesting bit of kit, and that's a well, uh, that is a well-engineered product, and it'd be super duper reliable, and it's exactly what you'd uh, expect from a Sony sort of like you know professional GPS position um, positioning system, because like no, you know, your average consumer Joe wouldn't be buying this thing. Back in the uh, early 90s, of course, you know, it'd be a serious bit of kit on a boat or uh, something like that. So that is a nice bit of engineering. I don't know the specs of it. I don't know how many channels the receiver is. Uh, for example, I mean, we're used to, you know, the 12, well, back in the uh, late 90s, you know, 12 channel receivers. I'm not sure how many they were before that. But, you know, as soon as GPS really took off when they, uh, Bill Clinton turned off the selective availability in uh, 2000. And then it got, you know, meters accuracy. Whereas this one back in the day, hundreds of meters due to the uh, selective availability being on. So it was only good for, you know, getting you on the right side of a port or something like that. It's amazing how, uh, you know, this has become just like 
basically bugger all. You can get this inside a watch now. And of course, everyone's got GPS receivers in their phones and it's just taken for granted. This did, wouldn't have nearly the processing power that even ones like less than a decade later did, let alone now. I mean, it's just a crazy difference. But yeah. That's how it was done back in 1991. Is that the, I think that's the earliest GPS receiver we've had. Hi to Nick Hume from Canada and all my Canadian uh, viewers um, from some weird ass postcode in Canada. I don't know where it is. Anyway, um, Canadian post. No, it's not uh, from Amazon. So let's um, crack this thing open. easy easy button to add to my button collection <laughs> awesome and let's have a squiz inside what is it hey looks like Ta -da! looks like it's some modular power supply thingamabob and nick is sending this hp esp 128 um server uh power supply like a plug-in rack uh power supply it's yaft <laughs> <laughs> anyway, two minute teardown. Wow, check it out. This is jam packed. They haven't wasted any room, have they? It looks like it's built like a brick dunny and absolutely nice bit of engineering from first look here. But look how densely packed everything is. Wow, unbelievable. And everything's up. Oh, you've got an isolation card down in there. And Wow, look at that, look, those big, is that like two big shunts? What's going on there? Are they uh, current shunts maybe? Hmm, oh wow, look at that. That is just incredible systems engineering there. I like it, look, they've even cut out the PCB there so that the main DC rectifier cap here, um, it, it just didn't have room. They couldn't fit it in the form factor uh, required because this would have been a certain form factor thickness. So like, let's cut out the board and we'll just stick it through and ah, we gain an extra couple of millimetres there. No worries. And they've done a similar thing for these inductors. Are they uh, common mode? They're probably uh, common mode chokes there. And look, I mean, the, they couldn't fit the wind. They needed like half a millimetre or something. So they go, well, we've got a 1.6 millimetre PCB. And well, you know, that's a, <laughs> we can gain 1.6 millimetres there. Thank you very much. Do the cutout because we needed that uh, strap over the back of it and we couldn't afford the space. That is great. They've got uh, the uh, black um, uh, stick on feet thing to isolate it from the back so that it doesn't uh, short out to any raised pins. And there's a whole bunch of dense uh, stuff around here to control all the, um, actually that's a, that's a big double sided load, that one. So there's lots of, lots of engineering that goes into this puppy. It's absolutely brilliant. It's going to have all the requisite protection and everything else. Bet your bottom dollar. No wackers. And what have we got there? Two big links. They are current shunt resistors. Sure enough, they label them. Ah, so, yep. They're big, uh, they're input shunt resistors, are they? Fantastic bit of engineering. Now, this would have, of course, this is like a hot swappable uh, server power supply. So you can just, you know, whack the things in that have multiple ones in parallel. So if one of them dies, it, presumably it would report back any uh, failures and things like that. So you'd know it died. Does it have any indicators on the front? No, it probably, I don't know the architecture, but it probably reports back. Look, it's got some uh, data type stuff happening there. So it's obviously going to report. Yep, there we go. It's going to report something back. So these are the big power things. What does it do? It does uh, 12 volts. Uh, yeah, the usual stuff. Plus minus 12 and 5 volts. Uh, standby, 3.3. .3. And oh, 7 volts actually. So there you go. But yeah, um, and it's got all the requisite approvals and everything else. They've really engineered this properly and cut no corners, spared no expense, and every lily gilded. Although what seems interesting is these look like they're uh, passive uh, cooling, doesn't look like they're active cooling at all, and uh, certainly the uh, heat sinks in here aren't uh, dissipating or going out to the external metal here, so um, probably well over engineered in terms of uh, passive cooling, although they might have some other external, I mean they've got the grills here, 
So I maybe there's some other fan in the system or something like that. That's I'm not sure exactly what the uh, server rack looks like that this plugs into. So they may have some air, but like yeah, air's not getting through that thing in a hurry. Imagine trying to push air through one end and <laughs> expecting it to get out the other end. It's like, jeez, it's going to be screaming by the time it gets out. Anyway, that's a beautiful bit of kit. Thank you very much, Nick. Fascinating. And of course, it's a Rubicon cap. Thank you very much. No one hung low rubbish in here. Hi to all my Australian viewers. Bloody ripper. Um, this one's from Nano Protech Australia. It doesn't actually say who, um, but thank you very much. This one sounds interesting. There is a ball racing around in here. I think I might know what it is. If it is, it's the... Um, gentleman who, sorry I forget your name, who met me at Maker Fair and said he was working on this. I think, I assume it is because it involved a ball bearing. So, uh, no, it's not. <laughs> sorry to the person at Maker Fair who, um, it was, I won't tell you what it is. Anyway, um, was going to send one in. It's not that. Um, I am a mechanic and love fiction. The Douglas, thank you very much. I uh, found this product. Ooh, okay. We have products. He loves it. Nano Protech. He's a Nano Protech. It doesn't work for him. No, he just thinks it's the duck's guts. Now, as it turns out, Doug actually smells some BS here, perhaps. Um, this uh, New Zealand company have this uh, Nano Protech um, stuff. They've got uh, anti corrosion spray, okay, super lubricant, fantastic. But the one he's interested in is this one here, super insulation. And apparently, look, it shows a multimeter on top, so you, like, you can spray it into your multimeter, and it's supposed liquid electrical insulation completely displaces moisture prevents short circuits for equipment with uh, voltage ratings from 3 to 10,000 volts or what happens if you use it on a 1.5 volt <laughs> <laughs> increases insulation resistance by up to a thousand percent reliable protection for more than one year now that second last one increases insulation resistance by up to a thousand percent the only way it can do that Okay, we're talking three orders of magnitude here. The only way it could possibly do that is to leave the coating on the board like it's almost like a conformal type uh, coating to stop creepage from uh, one component to the other, which normally goes across the PCB, the surface of the PCB, which can become contaminated with dust and crap and all sorts of grime and all that sort of, you know, fingerprints and all sorts of stuff. So the only way it can do that is mask that by almost like conformally coating it with nanotech particles. Hang on. Yeah, I think I smell some marketing bullshit here. Check it out. Water penetrates your product at the microscopic scale and begins damaging your equipment. Then you spray it with Nano Protec, trademark I'm sure, and a registered trademark and patent or whatever. Anyway, Nano penetrates deeply to completely displace moisture. Stable, invisible Nano coating provides durable long-term protection. And you're supposed to be able to use it on all sorts of automotive, marine, agricultural, robotics, industrial, construction, all sorts of stuff spray directly on circuit boards. It's not like it's like for connectors or anything like that. They're talking about spraying electronics. I don't like the sound of this. And look, they have a freaking drill underwater. Are you shitting me? And of course, all good marketing is going to put a time limit on the product. Oh, it only lasts for a year, so you got to, you know, spray it again, buy another can. Hmm. Now, I'm sure it does something and works to some extent, but I suspect that this is going to be mostly marketing bullshit um you know like half the stuff they're going to be claiming is just bs anyway maybe i can do a separate video testing this if you've got any good ideas about uh what would make an adequate test to test liquid electrical insulation leave it in the comments hmm and i think the correct motion for this product is to grip it tight and go like that Nanoparticles penetrate at the molecular level, oh yeah, feel it, into the structure of the equipment to displace water molecules and fight oxidization. Oh. 
So, yep, they're claiming you can leave your drill out in the rain. Look at that. Hmm. And phrases like this set off my bullshit detector. Nano Protec has been confirmed in tests by experienced professionals who, to be superior to market competitors. So, yeah, no, we haven't had it independently tested by UL Lab under control conditions. No experienced professionals have tested this thing. No worries. She'll be right, mate. Lithuania's winning today's mailbag. Um, this one's from um, Energist Power Solutions. Once again, from Villain. Everything's happening in Villain... Vilnius, Vilnius in Lithuania. Um, Time-sensitive competition coming up. Oops, sorry. Um, it didn't put a date on here though. Although it is, it's been here a while. So sorry if the competition's over. It doesn't say Kickstarter. It says competition. So I don't know what's doing there. But uh, let's have a look. We've got. Oh, what on earth is? Oh. Oh, okay, yeah, that didn't survive the trip. Nice thought, but traditional Lithuanian sweet honey cake mushroom. Don't worry, these are not magic and hopefully not too dry or smashed on arrival. Yeah, they got smashed on arrival and the box is full of um, chocolatey coated honey cake goodness. Oh dear. Anyway, we have something with a huge number of cells in it. Wow, it's a big four-point temperature sensor lithium-ion module battery pack. Serenus has sent in an interesting uh, letter here. Um, they've developed this little uh, lithium-ion battery module that does uh, four-point uh, temperature sensing in the thing. You can probably see the little board down in there. I think that's as far as I can probably take this puppy apart, perhaps. Hmm, I'm not sure. Maybe the top. Thing comes off anyway could be welded shut I'm not sure anyway it's uh to do with um it's a startup that they're done to uh, develop battery packs so a big part of this is uh, these formula competitions for electric vehicles electric formula student teams at various universities around the world and uh, stuff like this and there um, the main issue students face is that is battery size and weight is safety related to construction constraints as per the rules no point of battery can get hotter than 60 degrees during competition very sensible and soldering is prohibited ah interesting but the biggest struggle is temperature man management at least 30 percent of the cells must be monitored sensor can't be further away from 10 millimeters from the negative pole of the cell Wow, they've done everything in the rules. Unbelievable. Now, typical traction batteries contain around 100 modules in series. Wow. And if you go with modern cells about eight in parallel, that's 240 measurement points. Huge rat's nest of, you know, of uh, monitoring and things like that. Yeah, it's a big deal, you know, when you're monitoring temperatures like in the, you know, the Tesla car battery pack and things like that. There's a lot of engineering which... Uh, goes into it. Anyway, um, it 3.6 volt pack, 20 amp hours, 427 grams, um, contains an analog four point temperature sensor, acts as a hotspot detector, reporting only the highest temperature of the eight cells. There you go. Very, very interesting. Each cell has its own fuse. Yep, I'd uh, expect that for this sort of thing. So um, I assume they use a poly switch or something like that, perhaps. Anyway, um, that's very Interesting. I'll leave a link down below if you're after something like this for your electric vehicle thing or competition thing or something like that. Awesome work. They've got a full data sheet for this thing. It uses uh, Samsung cells, top of the range, no, uh, you know, one hung low Chinese rubbish. And there's all the specs for those playing along at home and all sorts of, oh, got lots of, uh, got discharge characteristics and Stuff like that, test methods, very nice, temperature voltage uh, response, and showing where the temperature sensor is inside the thing. Neat. Aha, uh -huh, they've got a balancing, uh, some balancing switches in there, and all sorts of jazz. So that's a nice little advanced little pack. They've put a lot of engineering into that. Well done. I'll link in the data sheet down below. Check it out. It's a Lithuanian bonanza. Thank you very much, uh, Sulis Luke. Lukeski, uh, you... <laughs> have not got that right. Have not got it right. Unbelievable Lithuania punching above their weight. What's in the foam? What is in the foam? It's a funky looking case. Oh, I reckon 
I reckon that's a Raspberry Pi. Wow. Yep. That's that's neat. That's a Raspberry Pi case with heat sinking built into the thing. Oh, jeez. That's nice die cast alloy too. I mean, um, nice anodized uh, alloy. That's awesome. Wow. And uh, guess a few little screws and whatnot. Yes, there is a note. And Sulius, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, is, uh, there's the website, I'll link it in down below. And we have ourselves, check it out, a Raspberry Pi case, I assume it's the Pi 3, is it? Anyway, look at that, that's a nice bit of kit. Notice the big, uh, two big heatsink uh, prods in there, yes it does come with a little pack of, oh you get screws, cap head, nice, love cap head screws, uh, some feet, and they're our, uh, they're our two thermal pads by the look of it. Ah, you even get the old Allen key. Beauty. Anyway, that looks like a very nice bit of kit. I'm going to put my Pi 3 in there and see how it goes. Yep, it's certainly designed for the Pi 3. All right, that fits in there very nicely. There's a little bit of uh, wiggle around there. And of course, then those two are going to go on there. I'll have to stick the uh, pads on, of course. But that, hopefully, should just fit over the top like that. Is there much? Oh, doesn't seem to be much. There's not a lot of wiggle in there, so that's a really nice fit. They've got the recessed cutout around there, so you know you can get the um, the uh, phono connector in there and the HDMI uh, because they've got big bit of plastic around there and the uh, USB as well. It doesn't fail on the case, so it's all recessed. That is nice. You can reach the SD card down in there. You can't get it with your finger though. You've got to uh, poke it with something, but that's all right. And it's got access for um, your uh, expansion as well. Nice case. Thumbs up. I like it. I'm going to use it for my Raspberry Pi. Beauty. I'll link it. Thank you very much, uh, Sulas. I'll link that in down below. Check it out. And I just confirmed that those pads do actually touch because I just pushed that in there and felt a little bit of a squeeze, but it did lift out. You saw that. So, yep. Perfectly designed. Exactly, you, know, you can see a little bit of sponginess in there. Ah, perfect. So the only thing I'm going to be concerned about with this is the uh, Wi-Fi. Does it still work? Um, I'll find out. But if it doesn't, I'll um, post it in the uh, oh, added annotation. Hi to all my viewers in the old dart. We've got one from M Tandy. Thank you very much, M. Um, from Half Halffield, is it? Hmm. In the UK, the old dart. What do we got? Some old crusty bit of kit. Battery. <laughs> what is it? I don't know. Oh, Panasonic a CFU1 tough book. Wow, it wasn't too tough, was it? The screen is completely shattered on it. And yeah, it looks like it's had better days. Oh, wow. But that would have been the duck's guts. You know, you need a portable computer solution. That's rugged as beauty. Thank you very much, Michael, for sending in this. <laughs> have you seen anything in worse shape than this? Oh, my goodness. The Panasonic CFU1 tough book, which would be really tough. But what the hell has happened to this thing? Oh, all the glass is just shattered. Unbelievable. Wow. Anyway, um, yeah, everything's missing from it. The battery, uh, two batteries and all sorts of stuff. But uh, um, yeah, this would have been the duck's guts back in the day. It uh, runs Windows XP and Windows 7 on an Intel Atom uh, processor. So Michael says they used to give these to their delivery uh, drivers for, you know, I don't know, scanning stuff in and, you know, things like that. Um, and well, yeah, look, the nice little uh, flaps there, sort of like weatherproof uh, flaps. Yeah, decent bit of kit. Anyway, oh yes, look, built-in scanner. There we go. There we go. So it is designed to uh, do the, um, the scanning barcodes and uh, stuff like that. I thought maybe they plug it in an external uh, barcode uh, wand, but no, all built in. So we love vintage teardowns, uh, vintage computer. Tell well, not vin Is this? Yeah, how old? It's not super latest but it's not you know 80s or anything like that so um it's reasonably recent so i'll oh, definitely that's worthy of a separate teardown because there could be a lot of uh, nice rugged engineering inside that puppy anyway we'll leave that to a separate video hope you enjoyed mailbag catch you next time 
I, check this out. Caching with altitude. Um, yes, I'm into uh, geocaching. Uh, for those who've um, been watching the blog for a long time, you might know that. I used to be big in the geocaching community way back in the day. I don't know it much these days, but uh, this is a geocaching waypoint decoder. Fantastic. Look how he's done the uh, ground speak um, uh, symbol there. With Let's go. We're climbing. Ta-da! Up we go. Come on, 10 feet left, you can do it. 